Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Andrew Stotts, I'm the Emperor of Sumeria, and today I want to talk about why commodity money is superior to fiat currency. So our position when it comes to the question of commodity money, sometimes called sound money, and fiat currency is very well established. We believe that commodity money, where the value of the money is derived from the commodity itself, such as gold and silver, is far superior to fiat currency, which often consists of bits of paper or digits on a screen that a bank or government has insisted has value, when in fact it has no intrinsic value whatsoever. And because of the nature of fiat currency, it can be created out of thin air at no cost uh, and it is limitless in supply. So it is not only worthless, but it is also limitless in supply. And this obviously causes a lot of problems for uh, a lot of macronations and in particular micronations. And I want to discuss this in more detail. And while we were going to make a video about this anyway, because of a conversation that I was having with a representative from Ladonia who was interested in learning more about our own monetary system, uh, I had been sent a link uh, a short while ago to a video in which a, a micronationalist uh, said the complete opposite of what I'm about to go through. They insisted that fiat currency, this uh, worthless uh, token, which is limitless in supply, is superior to commodity money. And uh, I, I watched the video and I, I just couldn't grasp where exactly they were coming from. And I wanted to make this video, um, as I say, anyway, but I wanted to reiterate the point that this sort of subject is very important because this goes beyond micronationalism. This is something that affects everyone in the world. I mean, it, I will give, I will go into more details about this. I'll give some examples as to what I'm talking about. But the point is that this uh, is very important and this is why we hark on about it so much because without money, without something sustainable and uh, enduring, then nothing else matters. And as I say, I will get on to this uh, in a moment, uh, but I just wanted to make that clear from the outset. This is a very important topic and I am going to go quite in depth into this. So for those who aren't interested in establishing a monetary system for their micronation, then this video really isn't for you because there's going to be a lot of discussion about monetary systems. Uh, I won't delve into the, the history too much if I can avoid it. I just want to talk about the practicalities, the realities of the different monetary systems that are available. And I'm going to use a, uh, a document that I prepared before I established the Empire of Stemeria. Uh, there was about a six, nine month period in which I was delving into the uh, the ins and outs of how to establish uh, a monetary system, among other things. But a monetary system in particular was something that caught my attention. And uh, I found this old uh, document that uh, I wrote up when uh, I was you know, coming up with the values and objectives of the Empire of Stemeria. And this is something that I actually forwarded to the representative from Ladonia. And I thought it would make an interesting talking point. So what I've done is I've taken this document, I've added a bit more to it, I've um, sort of uh, adjusted it a little bit to make it uh, make more sense uh, with me talking about it here. Uh, but 
uh, I am going to uh, read this effectively off a script, which is not something I typically do, it's not something I really like doing, but because of the importance of this, I just don't want to miss anything out. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it out, this, uh, this document that I prepared, and afterwards I will talk specifically as to why, um, even though what I'm talking about now is going to be in uh, to do with macronational uh, economics and macronational monetary systems, it is very applicable to micronations. But at the end of this video, I am going to talk about micronations and micronational money and micronational fiat currency uh, specifically. So with that in mind, with all those uh, uh, caveats in place, let's get started. Understanding what money is, how we've replaced money with currency, and why currency is doomed to failure is absolutely essential to the survival of any nation, macronational or otherwise. The very definition of money, often called real, sound or commodity money, is something that derives its purchasing power from its relative scarcity and the intrinsic value of the commodity itself. This is the fundamental difference between money and currency such as the pound, the euro, or the dollar. Currency is a medium of exchange and a unit of account. It's portable, durable, divisible, and fungible. Money is all of these things, but it's also a store of value that preserves the economic energy that is your time and freedom. Currency does not act as a store of value because it's created from nothing and it's backed by nothing. It's not scarce, has no intrinsic value whatsoever, and its purchasing power is based solely on faith. You purchased something for a pound today, so you have faith that it will purchase something for a pound tomorrow. This is a collective madness that the entire world has come to embrace. We trade our time and freedom for worthless bits of paper or digits on a screen because we've all agreed that it has value. The problem stems from the fact that it doesn't have any value at all. All currencies are created by governments and banks, and there is nothing to restrict the supply of new currency from flooding the market at any given time, and this should be a concern for anyone that works for or holds their savings in a currency of any kind. For example, let's say you have £10,000 saved in your bank. If the currency supply doubles, Suddenly, the £10,000 in currency that you've saved up over the years has just halved in value. This is because once the currency supply doubles, so too will the prices of goods and services. This is the true meaning of inflation. It's not necessarily the rise in prices of goods and services, as most people believe, but rather the expansion of the currency supply. The rise in prices of goods and services are merely a symptom of the expanding currency supply as the market tries to absorb the excess currency. For example, the cost of the average UK home in the 1950s was only £2,000 because the pound was far more valuable back then. Had someone saved £2,000 in the 1950s and held on to it as cash until today, they would have gone from being able to afford a mortgage-free home in the 1950s to only being able to afford a second-hand car in the 2020s. And in another 70 years' time, if the pound even exists at that point, it's possible that the same £2,000 wouldn't be enough to buy a pack of gum. All because inflation the expansion of the currency supply by governments and banks is constantly devaluing the currency already in circulation. And this is done not only through deficit spending, but also through what's called fractional reserve banking, where, as the term suggests, banks loan out money with only a fraction of the funds to hand. So when you deposit £100 into a bank, they're typing in £1,000 into the system, loaning out £900 and charging interest on it. It's a scam. So why do governments allow this? Put simply, it's because it's in their short-term interests. Using money is not favoured by governments because it limits their spending power. They can't spend more than what they bring in. And this deficit spending is one of the primary reasons as to why the UK now has a national debt that now stands at over £2.5 trillion. After all, what political party is going to say, guys, this can't go on. We're going to have to stop creating more currency, make severe cutbacks in the public sector and raise taxes in order to stabilise the monetary system. They won't because people are short sighted and don't want to endure short term hardships. They'd rather vote for the party that says 
Vote for me and I'll spend more on the public sector and may even reduce your taxes. But most people simply don't understand that these sorts of policies require the creation of more currency, which dilutes the existing circulating supply, increases the prices of goods and services and devalues the purchasing power of people's savings. This isn't some theory. This has played out a thousand times before and it is playing out before our eyes today. The International Monetary Fund said only last month that it expects global inflation to rise by around 7.5%. But there are many nations that are going through rates of inflation from anywhere between 20% and 280%. Zimbabwe, Sudan, Venezuela, Argentina, Turkey, Ethiopia, Estonia, Moldova, Sri Lanka. These are but a handful of nations that are suffering from inflation to the point where people are getting rid of their currency as fast as they can because it's losing purchasing power with every minute that they hold on to it. Hundreds of millions of people all over the world are losing everything and living in poverty because their governments lost control of a monetary system based on faith that was doomed from the outset. And this is the ultimate fate of all currency. Money such as gold and silver, is superior because there is a limited supply. It takes time and energy to find, mine and refine. And they have a wide range of industrial and medicinal uses. All of this preserves their value and purchasing power. It's not something that can be effortlessly printed out of thin air or typed into a computer system. Much of humanity has used gold, silver and other precious metals for money for thousands of years, with the first coins being minted in modern Turkey some two and a half thousand years ago. Just like today, however, governments have constantly sought to spend more than they bring in, and they did so for thousands of years by debasing the money of their people. A common practice throughout history has been for a government to collect gold or silver coins in taxes, melt them down and add cheaper metals such as copper so that these coins were no longer pure gold or silver. This means that the government could increase the number of coins in circulation and could do so further simply by adding more cheap metals into the melting pot. The end result is that what started out as a pure gold coin, with its purchasing power coming from the value of the gold itself, was eventually only 50% gold, then 40%, then 30%, and so on until there was no gold left in the coin at all. It had become a currency, not real money. A similar problem arises with precious metal standards, such as the gold standard or the silver standard. What this essentially means is that a government or bank will keep your gold or silver locked up safely and will give you a paper note that says you own some of that gold or silver. These paper notes then became a more convenient and widely accepted form of money for daily transactions, as anyone could turn in their paper notes for gold or silver at any point. This is where the paper currency that we use today originated. The first known standard was in China over a thousand years ago, but it wasn't until the 17th century that this system became more widely adopted. The problem, as always, is that governments and banks cannot be trusted. Realising that people didn't often turn in their paper notes for gold or silver, they started to issue paper notes without any gold or silver to back it up. At that point, the precious metal standard drifts into just another currency, with the total supply of paper notes in the market far outweighing the amount of gold or silver available to back it all up. Sooner or later though, once people begin to realise that their wealth has been stolen by their own government and the money that they thought they had has been debased or is backed up by nothing, hyperinflation and economic crisis will give way to unrest, revolt and the eventual collapse of the nation itself. It's an inevitability that's occurred countless times throughout history. That is why using gold or silver as a form of sound money is so important to us. It's about preserving the wealth of the people, limiting the power of the government and preventing the collapse of the community that we're looking to build. A nation without sound money is destined to fall. Now, many will say, well, the Western world and the US in particular will never suffer from this sort of inflation. The pound, the euro, the dollar is somehow different from every other currency in history. It's the this time it will be different theory that so often plunges human civilization into oblivion over and over again. And it's this fallacy, this coping mechanism that people cling on to despite knowing the facts that is so dangerous. So to finish off, 
Let's debunk a few myths that are occasionally peddled by those that claim fiat currency, a worthless medium of exchange that's limited in supply and controlled by untrustworthy, corrupt or incompetent governments and banks is superior to sound money. First, the US did not abandon the gold standard during the Great Depression. The US government still required gold to produce currency. What actually happened is that President Roosevelt announced Executive Order 6102, which, among other things, made it illegal for US citizens to buy, trade, or even hold more than $100 worth of gold. The US government confiscated the gold of its own citizens, paid them a little over $20 an ounce for it, and then, once they had it, proclaimed that the actual price of gold was now $35 an ounce. And they did this just so they could print more currency. This particular event goes to show why governments shouldn't be given control over monetary policy. Not only did they steal money from their own citizens and give them currency in return, but they then immediately devalued the currency that they'd just given them by proclaiming that gold was actually worth far more than what they bought it at, and then proceeded to inject even more currency into the circulating supply, diluting the value of the currency even further. It's quite incredible when you think about it, and it's a perfect example of why precious metal standards don't work. But this wasn't the end of the gold standard in the US. As per the Bretton Woods system, which was a post-World War II global monetary policy in which the world's currencies would be pegged to the dollar, and the dollar would be pegged to gold, $35 could be converted to one ounce of gold. Not for US citizens, mind you, only for foreign governments and banks. Can't let the peasants get a hold of real money, you see. But in 1971, President Nixon stopped the convertibility of dollars for gold at a fixed price. Since then, the dollar has lost 86% of its purchasing power, whereas the purchasing power of one ounce of gold has gone up by 4,800%. But what about more modern times? Surely things have stabilised since then. Well, no. The dollar has lost 40% of its purchasing power in the last 20 years, and it's lost 22% of its purchasing power in the last 10 years. But as we've already discussed, many other national currencies have collapsed far quicker. Then there's the argument that gold and silver will become worthless once it's mined from asteroids, putting aside the vast costs involved in mining asteroids and transporting the materials back to Earth, or the fact that the technology to mine asteroids in any significant way has yet to be invented, simply saying there's more gold and silver in space, therefore gold and silver are actually worthless, is the equivalent of saying there's more land on other planets, therefore all land on Earth is actually worthless. Like land, gold and silver has value because it is still comparatively scarce and can be utilised. They're an almost indestructible metal that have incredible industrial and medicinal properties. And while I can't predict how asteroid mining will affect gold and silver prices over the course of hundreds or thousands of years, I am confident that we won't be measuring their value in any of the currencies that we're using today. It is, of course, easy to say how wonderful it is to have an unlimited supply of worthless currency when times are good. But I would challenge anyone to go and convince someone from a nation that has already had their savings and prosperity inflated away that a currency that is controlled by governments and banks is in their interests. Perhaps go to Venezuela, where some 75% of the population now live in extreme poverty, and explain to them why such a monetary system is such a great idea. To be clear, there is no such thing as a perfect monetary system, and even the utilisation of money has its flaws. But the point I want to make is simple. Just because a monetary system that utilises money can present problems, these are nothing compared to the scale of impoverishment that every person on the planet will face if they don't prepare themselves for the inevitable collapse of all currency. So I hope that gives someone, somewhere, a better grasp of why monetary systems matter, why choosing the right one matters, why understanding how the world works matters. Because there are people across the world, as I say, hundreds of millions of people that are suffering who are being uh, driven into poverty, extreme poverty, because of the actions of banks and governments creating a currency and then inflating it into oblivion, who are mismanaging their own monetary systems and therefore their economies. And this matters. 
because not only are they uh, destroying the lives and the livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people, but it all has a knock-on effect. In particular, if you look at the Western world, if we get to the uh, in levels of inflation that some of these other countries are going through, where it gets to 20%, 30%, 40% and more, which will happen at some point, then everything else is uh, of a secondary concern. So if, uh, you know, you have people who are uh, having their life savings wiped out, who are their pensions gone, who have lost their jobs because of this uh, inflation, because of the uh, the decimation of the monetary system that they're, they base their whole economy on. Uh, what happens? Environmentalism, that's, that's not a concern. You know, better establishing and developing uh, third world countries, that's not a concern. Charitable organisations, that's not a concern. Uh, protecting the interests of the, the most vulnerable in your society, that's not a concern. What is a concern is providing for yourself and for your family in the immediate term. If you're, you know, uh, got you know, wheelbarrowing um, a mountain of cash, of physical cash, to buy a loaf of bread, you're not worrying about the penguins in, uh, in Antarctica, are you? You're worrying about survival. And so this is what I talk about when I talk about monetary systems, when I talk about monetary policy, why I think commodity money is important is because the people that will survive the storms to come will be those who invest in some sort of commodity, some sort of deflationary asset, because ultimately that is the way that the world will go. If you want to know what's going to happen to the dollar, the pound, the euro, the yen, and every other macronational fiat currency in the world, you don't have to look any further than the other countries around you, because that is what is going to happen sooner or later. It might not be in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, but it will happen. And if you are fortunate, like the ones uh, in Venezuela that did have some gold or silver to hand and an ounce of gold will buy you a home and uh, an ounce of silver will buy you a month's groceries for a family of five. If that's the position that the rest of the world is going to end up in, people need to be prepared for that. They need to be protected from that. And I, I, I get very passionate about it and I get very frustrated when I see people trying to big up currency as if it's the best thing in the world, because it's not. It's a con. It's a scam. These good times that we're experiencing, it's all an illusion. It's all based on imaginary wealth. And the only people that will benefit from this at the end of the day are the extremely wealthy who have taken fiat currency, uh, this cheap credit, and purchased assets. And when it all, uh, you know, implodes, they will be protected because they will have assets that will appreciate in value. Whereas everyone that holds on to fiat currency, everyone that has, you know, five, 10, 15, 20, 100,000 pounds in the bank or however much, that will eventually be worth nothing. And so this is, again, I, I get passionate about it because it's important. Without sound monetary system in place, nothing else matters. And it's as simple as that. Now, with all that said, I want to talk about micronational fiat currency and micronational uh, money. And I want to talk about the, uh, the three monetary systems that there are. Uh, I, I alluded to that, I think, rather well in the, in the, the blurb that I've just done. Um, but I want to talk about these three systems and why only one of them is something that you should pursue, in my opinion. I'm not a financial advisor. I can't tell you what to do with your money. I can't tell you what to do with your micronation. I only can only give you the information that I have and share it with you. And you can make up your own decision as to whether or not it's the way to go, but this is what we are doing. And this is what I would encourage others to do if they are of the same mindset. So the three monetary systems that you can choose from are fiat currency, commodity-based currency, and commodity money. Fiat currency is where the leader of that micronation, the governing body of that micronation, has a note or some sort of token, and they say, this has value. It has no intrinsic value, but they're saying that it has value, and so it has value. That is the way they uh, they, they like to think that this works, uh, because they've seen micronations do it, and they're kind of replicating that. But the problem is, obviously, macronations have a lot more credibility um, when compared to micronational governing bodies for many obvious reasons. And so no one outside of that micronation, and perhaps not even the people within inside that micronation, uh, value that currency at all. 
They will not give their time, their energy, their, their goods for that. Who in their right mind, after all, would send, you know, a hundred or a thousand pounds worth of produce to a micronation in return for something that you can print off at home on your own A4 printer? It just doesn't make sense. And so you go on to the next level, commodity-based currency. So, all right, this currency is actually uh, convertible to the commodity. We're holding on to the commodity and we're issuing currency as a representative of what that commodity is, but then you can, you know, you can uh, exchange it for that at any point. But the issue then is that you get into the, uh, the question of whether or not you trust that micronation to honor that, because there are micronations out there that will try to screw you over. Um, you might accumulate a massive amount of that micronation's currency, and when it comes to it, when you go, yep, I want to be able to uh, exchange that for an ounce of silver or whatever else, they'll go, oh, sorry, no, I can't do that. Or you don't hear from them, or they shut up shop. And the final one that you can go through is commodity money. Now, this is the safest way to go about it, and this is the system that we use, because when we give someone a silver coin, they've got the silver. They don't have to trust us to, to honour any... Uh, agreement in terms of exchanging that silver for the currency or anything else, they are just getting the silver for the product or the service they're providing. It's as simple as that. And I think this all boils down to two main issues, value and trust. In terms of value, fiat currency and commodity-based currency has no value. When it comes to uh, trust, do you trust that micronation to honour uh, an exchange? If it's a commodity-based currency, do you trust that micronation to still be around? Do you trust that micronation to uh, still be here in two weeks, in a month, in a year? Because micronations, as a lot of people well know, have very short life expectancies. So if you spend all of this time accumulating their currency, you're sending them goods, they're sending you currency, and when it comes to uh, cash in, they go, uh, actually we're defunct now, thanks very much for the goods, uh, enjoy your bits of paper. That can happen, and I'm sure that has happened. Um, and I th again, I just have to reiterate, the safest and most sensible way to go about establishing a monetary system on a macronational scale and a micronational scale is a commodity money of some kind, where the value is derived from the commodity itself. It will protect you uh, in micronational circles and in the real world. And I think this is what it comes down to. I'm passionate about trying to protect people's wealth. I am trying to ensure that people get fair value out of the work that they put into something. And this is the only real way to do it, especially in micronational circles, because there's just, I think as much as anything, there is a trust issue in micronations because you don't know a lot of the time who these micronations are. You don't know if they're still gonna be around in a little while. You don't know if you're going to be able to exchange their fiat currency for the commodity that they say they have. It is far safer just to extract genuine value um, at the point of exchange. So if I give them a silver coin and they give me um, a jar of jam or a bottle of wine or a, a dozen eggs or whatever else, we know that exchange has happened. There's no, there's no debt, there's no credit, there's no IOUs involved. That exchange has happened. Fair value has been exchanged right there and then. And so this is the, the, the point I want to make and to drive home. If you are looking to establish a monetary system for your micronation, I would certainly not recommend fiat currency for all of the reasons that I've listed. Um, but I don't think I, I can ramble about this more than I already have. I think I've covered the, the basics as much as I can. If people want to learn more about this, please go and learn more about it because it is so important that more people understand this on a micronational level and a macronational level. So with all that in mind, if you wanted to become a part of the Stumerian community, please become a citizen through our Patreon campaign, the link of which I shall leave in the description below as always. You can also find the details of the other micronations that make up the Empire of Stumeria in the description below as well. But otherwise, if you did enjoy this video, please feel free to give it a like, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we'll catch you in the next one.